Okay. Be able well. to see. Great. So welcome back. Um, or rather, I suppose. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm back. I don't know what time it is, but that's okay. Um, six fifty. Six fifty a.m. or p.m. A.m. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem I'm in right now. It is. Uh, I got back Friday night at midnight, and it was twelve hours difference. So I'm a little jet. Doctor Adler's in Hong Kong right now. I did not know the Doctor Adler's in Hong Kong right now. That's pretty funny. About an email saying about it. Yeah. That's your head, totally. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I, I am here, and I am going to talk about a very specific paper, actually. Fairly recent paper, as these things go. Here's the paper. Uh, it's Computing Persistent Homology, which is the title of today's lecture. Today's lecture, it's also the title of this paper. Uh, the paper is by uh, Alfred Zomorodian and Gunnar Carlson. Let's forget, yep, one, one M, two S's. Uh, it's 2005. So, as far as math papers go, it's recent, like super recent. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you kind of an overview of what this paper is about and then explain some of the algorithmics of how it works. I'm not going to go in at the level of generality that they go after because this, what they do is they assume that you know some, uh, some abstract algebra and commutative algebra and manipulations of modules and other such things. <laughs> <laughs> and in particular, that you know about the Smith normal form, which, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I don't assume that you guys know all of that stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit some of the highlights of what's discussed in this paper um, and kind of explain why that is sort of the right approach, or at least certainly a right approach. And then we're going to simplify that a bit so that it's a little easier for us to understand at this level. Uh, but I will caveat you by saying that this is really one of the, the th this was really one of the papers that, that started the revolution of applied topology. The fact that you're able to compute persistent homology in a systematic algorithmic fashion. Has it been a peaceful revolution? It has been a peaceful revolution. In fact, the, the conference that I came back from um, was an engineering conference, and it is actually the signal processing conference. Um, so the, there, there is in mathematics, there's a bunch of umbrella organizations. The, the American Mathematical Society, there is the Mathematical Association of America in the United States. These are the primary umbrella math organizations here. Um, this particular conference I just came back from was the IEEE's Signal Processing Society, IEEE's the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or some permutation of those E's. Um, and they have a Signal Processing Society, which is a subgroup in there. This is that, that society's main meeting. Worth noting the attendance in this conference is the same, more or less, as the entire American Mathematical Society, Mathematical Association of America's conference. 3,500 people, roughly. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty big conference. And the point is, bringing these ideas, very much the ideas in this paper about persistent homology and its applications, uh, to the engineering community. So that's what we were doing. I think we had some degree of success there. And so what I want to do now is communicate some of the basic ideas that are behind that. All right, so first of all, the caveat. As I said verbally, this paper uses commutative algebra. You've seen PIDs. 
but, but not modules yet. That's right. And, and so cement. that's right. So PIDs are rings. This is a particular kind of ring. Let me set this in context. This is a particular kind of ring. That's a ring. And a module. It's basically the same axioms as a vector space. Whose coefficients are in a ring. The reason why we have separate name as opposed to vector space versus module, uh, first of all, there's a historical difference. Vector spaces are kind of the older concept. Does not have to be a ring with me, it's just a ring in general. Well, there's all sorts of discussion about this. <laughs> there are many different variations, and ring theory is sort of riddled with this particular axiomatic difference. Usually people want a ring with one, because then that, among other things, gives a module with much better behavior. Because in particular, the vector space axioms kind of go bad if you don't have one. Is it, so I've, I had this discussion with Professor Lamarzi, and when a ring doesn't have a unity, sometimes they call it an RNG. Yes. Yeah. Yes. R yeah, <laughs> exactly. So yeah, usually, usually with a one, Because otherwise, you can't write down the axioms of a vector space, like 1 times anything. Well, I don't have 1. Let's get the problem. Um, and so the, the, but the other big difference is the linguistic difference of, between module and vector space indicates that there's some actual qualitative difference, and there is. Vector spaces, finite dimensional vector spaces, are determined entirely by their dimension, up to isomorphism. Modules. Finitely generated modules are not. There are other properties that are necessary in order to write them down. In fact, if you have a finitely generated module over a general ring, even with a one, uh, the characterization is very, very subtle, and there isn't even a good one. If you have a module over principal ideal domain, well, then there's a nice characterization theorem you can write down. Uh, but it takes a bit of doing. And when you do that bit of doing, you end up writing down spent normal form. And so in particular, when you talk about maps between modules, so the analogous linear maps between modules, then when you, what, what you need to do is you want to understand well, what do those linear maps look like. You can decompose them into, I mean, in the vector space land, you break them up into kernel, co-kernel, image, and co-image. Well, that characterization isn't all you need for linear maps between modules. So there, there's some serious mathematical sophistication that goes into this paper. And the reason why they use this mathematical sophistication isn't just to show off, it's to account for certain kinds of information. Uh, and it's a very clever, very slick thing that they do. So I want to show you that so you can see how that plays out and why you would want to do it that way. Uh, and then step back and show you how algorithmically you don't have to worry quite so much about it. Okay. In particular, uh, the algorithm that we've thus far talked about, persistent homology. In fact, last time, if you look back at our notes, I did actually compute persistent homology on the board by hand, using a very pedestrian, simple kind of argument about argument about bases. And that, frankly, that works. The reason why it's not what these guys talked about is because it's super slow. This is much faster, but it requires a lot more sophistication. Okay, so let's sort of walk down this path and see, see what, what, what's under the hood of this paper. Okay, so the first observation is they're going to start off exactly the same way we started. The starting point is the same. The starting point is much the same as for us which is a filtration of simplicial complexes. Which is to say, I've got a simplicial complex x0, and it's a subcomplex of x1, which is a subcomplex of x2, and so on. So the idea is you go from smaller to bigger complexes. So you add simplicities as you go up the chain. So 
that's the same starting point as what, as what we started with last time. We've got a filtration of simplicial complexes. You add simplices. Every simplex has a definite time, a definite filtration index where it shows up. Simplex has a definite birth time or index, call it maybe, call it index k, where sigma k is in xk, but sigma is not in xk minus 1. Is this more related to relative homology instead of Ah, that's a very good question. There is a nice relationship between relative homology and not. There is. Although this particular paper doesn't go down that path. Okay. Yeah, there is, there is a nice way to think about this in terms of relative homology, but that's not what they're doing. So the idea is, what I'm going to do is I'd like to tag each of the simplices in my complex. Say if I keep going, eventually I'm going to stop. So eventually I reach a final one at the very end. You just call it plain X with no, no tags. All of the simplices in here showed up at some very definite time in here. Maybe they were there at the beginning, maybe they showed up nearly at the end. Don't know. Now, certainly each one of these are abstract simplicial complexes. So if I grab a simplex at any stage, all of its faces are in that simplicial complex. Okay. Now, what they do, though, at that stage then, is they say, well, I'd like to write down the boundary matrices. Now, what we did last time is we wrote down boundary matrices independently for each of these complexes, and then looked at simplicial maps from one to the other. What they're going to do here in this paper is a little different. What they're going to try to do is they're going to try to think of everything all at once. The reason for the everything all at once is that way you don't get in a situation where you have to extend bases. Part of the algorithm we talked about last time is, here's a, I'm going to compute a basis for homology here, and when I get to the next stage, I may have to rethink that basis a bit. I may have to extend it. They'd like to avoid doing that step, because that step is actually computational. So you need to go dig out your matrix, you need to look at that basis, you need to build a matrix for it, and then examine what is in the co-kernel of that matrix. So it's a, it's a sort of a, a long involved process. Rather than doing that, they're just going to deal with everything at once. The benefit is that then when they do reductions, they can do reductions all at once, too. So everything kind of happens together. And the way they're going to keep track of things is they're going to use this more sophisticated doctrine. OK, so here we go. So how are we going to do that? Can we get everything all at once? We don't have to extend the bases. That's right, because we we're actually going to do things. We're going to build our. We're going to build things. Really, what we, the idea, that the central idea of this paper is, what we want to do is we only want to have to compute homology once, once and for all for everything. That's what we want to do. So the goal <coughs> is compute homology. Once and only once. And cycle reduce the size of the matrices as we go. This part here we didn't talk about last time. We didn't do any reductions last time. So now I'm going to start folding in these reductions. So we did not do this. And that reduction turns out to be really important for, for making these computations something you can actually run without breaking your computer. OK. So the idea is we want to compute homology once and only once. And the way we're going to do that is we now need to keep track of, if I take a look at all the simplices in x, 
I need to keep track, I have to label each of the simplices with their birth time sum. And the way we're going to do that is through an algebraic trick. So, tactic. how to do this in a computer systematically. But if you do it by hand, you can kind of do it on the fly. In fact, if I hadn't given you the caveat from the outset that this is going to involve some more sophisticated math, I bet you could probably figure it out from the outset. Because it actually is just algebra souped up in a little bit. Souped up in the form of the matrix entries in my boundary matrix. Well, they're not numbers. They're elements in this ring, this PID. And in particular, they're polynomials. Now, I think everyone here is comfortable working with polynomials and doing algebra with them. So by hand, you can kind of do the algorithm that, that these folks developed. And doing it in a computer is a little dodgy without actually knowing the algebra at the sort of refined level. But we can do it on the board pretty easily. So the tactic here, how do we do this algebraic trick? Well, it's actually very simple. Turn the entries of our boundary matrices from numbers, 0, plus or minus 1, into polynomials. algebra on the polynomials. That's the idea. So I'm going to use the fact that I now have an additional degree of freedom or an additional degree of specificity. When I specify a polynomial, I've got a variable that I can play with. The variable will help me keep track of the different birth times. What's a birth time? Well, birth time is when that particular simplex shows up. So I've got a filtration of simplices. What is that? A simplicial complex. So what that means is I have a complex, and that complex is a subcomplex in the next one. It is a subcomplex in the next one. So I'm adding simplices as I go. So the birth time tells me, for a given simplex, when did it show up? Okay. The, the index of The index at which it showed up. And what I formalized here is it says, you know, it shows up at time k, yeah. but it wasn't present in time k minus 1. I, I will then say that sigma has a birth time of time k. Okay. And that, that's crucial, because now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that to help me write down a polynomial. All right. Uh, let me actually... All right. So, so an entry is like R adjoins Z, or R is a ring? Is that what you're getting at? Exactly. Basically something of that sort. They're actually R adjoin some variable. Some unspecified variable. Right. So X. X or T. T is probably a good thing to pick because it's like time. Mm -hmm. Birth time. So I'll use T. Mm -hmm. That's also consistent with the notation of paper. So if you pick up the paper and read it, and it's actually a pretty straightforward paper once you get over the algebra. And it's quite slick. Both of those people who wrote the paper are top-of-the-line researchers. Very, very good in terms of theory and computation. Actually, it's a, it's a very nice melding of the two. Zomorodian is actually more of a computer scientist. Mm -hmm. And Carlson is an algebraic topologist. Where are they from? So Carlson's at Stanford. And Zomorodian was at Dartmouth. Uh, and now, I think, works for a head fund. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Zomorodian is watching this video, I appreciate to know which, but you can not tell me. It's probably quite a sizable minimum investment. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you could probably at least a quarter million dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Beats me. Anyway, um, so let's do the algebra here. 
So if I've got an n-dimensional simplex, where does it live? Well, it's going to be in Cn. basis on in C n of x for sure. This is, remember, this, this guy here, this is the whole complex. This is the whole thing. Now remember, it's also true it's also in Cn of xk, where k is the birth time. talked about last time, where we computed out barcodes by hand, we did it with these guys. We had to deal with them independently, and we had to sew them together. So this is only for the n faces whose birth time is k, or earlier. I would really want to do everything up here, or all the simplices are in play. So this is a vector space, thus far. The trick now is we're going to turn it into something that looks like a vector space, but isn't, because the coefficients come from polynomials. All right, so let me take a little bit of a detour and explain how that trick works. So let's track birth lines. Algebra. How do we do that? Well, so the idea is rather than letting Cn of x be a R vector space, let's let the coefficients In, here comes our adjoint T. The real polynomials with one variable, or in one variable is usually how we say it, in one variable. If you don't like R, you can swap it up for any other field you might like. So if you want F2, field of two elements, go ahead and do that, then you don't have to worry about signs. 
I think keeping track of signs is usually useful in applications. Not always, but usually, so that's why we keep the R. But beware the temptation, especially among algebraic topologists, and they get very distracted in paper with this, is to choose the best such choice, which would put a Z in front of that. Polynomials in T with integer coefficients. There's a good theoretical reason for doing that. That's sort of the best choice. The problem with that is that this guy then is not a principal ideal domain and all sorts of trouble algebraically. So beware. And they go through a, a fair bit of discussion about whether or not that, that is the right choice in this case. They conclude that it's basically not, but that nevertheless they give you an algorithm for working with it. And then all sorts of caveats saying that this can have problems. But for our purposes, this will do. Okay, so now I'm going to use now, I'm going to use the exponent on t to keep track of the work. doing like the opposite of what you do in linear algebra? Where you take a polynomial and convert it to a matrix? Ah, that's an interesting point. Kind of, yeah. I guess you are. I guess you are. I think of it that way. Yeah. Because I want the algebra to work for me. I'm going to do algebra that's going to involve those exponents. And that's why this gets a little dicey if you're not doing it by hand. Okay, so we're going to use the exponent to track the birth time. So given, given n simplex sigma in Cn x with birth time k corresponds then to a basis of And what is that basis element going to be? Well, it's no longer going to be just sigma. It's going to be t to the k sigma. So if that simplex shows up at time 0, it's going to be just sigma k. Uh, it's just going to be sigma. If it shows up at time 1, it's going to be t times sigma. If it shows up at some other time, it's going to be t to the k, whatever that k is. So now these things here show up in my manipulations of my basis elements. Well, and they're going to show up in my matrix as well as coefficients that are going to show up in those that basis as well. Hmm. What's that going to look? Well, that's going to be now. I'm going to have these matrix matrix elements. They're going to have the t k is floating around in them. T to the k is or various polynomials. And when I start doing row or column operations on these matrices, my entries will be generally polynomials. But my end goal is the same. I want to row reduce or column reduce the matrix to find the kernel of such. But now you just got to keep track of all the polynomials and actually cancel out polynomials with zeros as well. And that probably involves some polynomial division and other such nasty things, which is why I really care about the fact that coefficients better be fields or I'm going to get into trouble real quick. Okay, so let's see how that goes. But this, this really, this is the, the main idea of that paper. Once you've done this, now you've taken that whole filtration and slammed everything into a single chain complex with fancier coefficients. That's now going to keep track of everything for you. And then from there on out, you just do linear algebra as you have intended. Yeah. So the coefficients of so the coefficients are polynomials, and also the matrix entries are polynomials. Yes. 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 Is matrix. Well, are coefficients. The, the co so, so yeah. So this, this, let me clear this up in terms of an example, so you can see what I mean. Because th th this is this is a little bit bizarre. Mm -hmm. Because in the end, we're doing linear algebra, right? Linear algebra is not about vector spaces. Linear algebra is about linear maps. The maps are what matter. The vector spaces, eh, take a <laughs> yes, you can see I'm a category theorist. I'm pretty sure that I've been told exactly the opposite. By who? I, I, I don't remember. Okay. It was like <laughs> years ago, but 
Better was Scott Becker's thesis. No, no. At least speaking to someone who has got category theory as as a as a preference. That's that's. What. But similarly, think about it this way: set theory is not really about sets; it's about functions. The functions are what matter. In fact, how do I know if two sets are the same thing? I have a bijection function. between them. I have a certain kind of function. That's what really drives what set, what, when sets are distinguishable or not. Similarly, well, how do I know if I've got the same vector space? Oh, it's up to isomorphism in your maps of a certain kind. The maps are what matters. And that still here, the maps are what matters. Mm -hmm. So never mind. This sort of beast now, this CN, is a module. It's like a vector space with ring coefficients. OK. So let's now see how this might look at example. <laughs> start out with a really simple example, just so you can see how this all plays out. Let's start out with an example that looks like this. I need to make a filtration, right? So it needs to start out with something that is a subcomplex of something else. So let me call this, my first subcomplex is just this. This is x0. x0 is just that. Just one point. x1, I add point at an edge, at an edge AB. Clearly x0 is a subset of x1, and let's just call that the end of the, end of the angle. Let's just call that this. Very, very simple example, but I want to write down then what the boundary matrix is for the appropriate chain complex. And it's going to be a chain complex, single chain complex, but the coefficients are going to be polynomials. All right. So the observation here is, that this is going to come in with a t, uh, t to the 0. And these guys, the a, b, and the b, are going to come in with a t to the 1. OK. So what is our chain complex going to look like? Well, it's going to go from c1 of x, the whole thing, to c0 of x, the whole thing, and to 0. Of course, there's nothing higher either, so no, no sense in writing that down. So what is this boundary 1 going to look like? Well, this boundary 1 has to tell me how everything plays. Now, unlike the previous case, a previous lecture, where I separated out these guys independently, this boundary 1 involves all of the simplices. So it involves, in particular, on the output side, all of the vertices in the whole complex. It involves all of the edges in the whole complex. All right, so here we go. So it involves all of the vertices and all of the edges. Now, as before, I've got the signs to worry about. So if I take a look at what is the sign in this slot, a plus or a minus or a zero? Well, if I delete the first entry, I don't get what I want. Do the second arrow entry, I do plus minus. This is going to come in with a minus, it's going to come in with a plus. OK, but now what's going to go here is not necessarily a 1 or a minus 1. It's not necessarily a 1. It now might depend on the coefficients. It depends on the coefficients that I'm going to assign to things. So when does the a show up? The a shows up at time 0. So this should be a t to the 0. <coughs> when does the b show up? A t to the 1. Or put another way. This is my matrix. That's my boundary matrix. This is kind of what I mean, that, that, that it corresponds to a basis element. I, don't, I, I do not specifically mean that I'm spanned by all of these vertices like this. I'm really kind of calling out the fact that these coefficients show up in this way. Does that answer your question, Dave? Uh, it might. I'm still uh, okay. letting it marinate. Okay. <laughs> now, what happens on this side of things? Oh, this is still zero map. That didn't change. But over here, something else is going on. So let's examine this one. I got a little bit of a problem, don't I? 
Because I want to do what to that matrix? I want to know its kernel. I want to know its image. Hmm. I want to know its kernel, I want to know its image, so that I can do my homology. Well, first off, I'm interested in the homology in degree zero. That requires the image of this matrix. I also want to know the homology in degree one. That requires the kernel of this matrix. Okay, fair enough. Now, these are modules, so that reasoning about dimension is not going to work. We're reasoning about the number of Generators. It's a little bit dicey. You can get fooled by things because things can cancel out when you were not expecting them to. Okay, so let's look at then what this looks like. In particular, let's compute zero, which is the kernel of boundary zero. This is H zero of X. Boundary zero module of the image of boundary one. Now the kernel of boundary zero is everything in that. Now, what is this span by? This is span by, well, it's got two vertices. It's kind of spanned by both of those vertices. But they don't necessarily come in at the same time, do they? Hmm. And the image, too, is kind of a little strange as well. Hmm. Hmm. So what, what is going on here? Well, the, this kernel is everything, essentially. This is everything. So the kernel of that basically looks like this. <coughs> and I'm writing them as vectors, but I really have to remember that I, they could be polynomials. Because everything gets up to zero. Now the image is really all the multiples, beware all of the polynomial multiples. So this is span over R T. I can multiply these things by any polynomial, not just any real number. As I can do over here, too, this is also multiply these guys by any polynomial. Hmm. Well, what does that mean that I get up here? Well, gosh, I got lots of possibilities, right? I put a, get a polynomial down below and a different polynomial. Well, that's kind of interesting. And, and similarly here, I can get any polynomial and any polynomial. Well, that's kind of interesting as well. Well, you can't get a degree lower, you can't get a degree zero polynomial, polynomial on the bottom. Aha! Good observation. That's the right thing to be thinking about now. Right. So I can put up here, so let's write this out. This is really then, as sets, any polynomial in T, any other polynomial in T here, and that's like the set of all of them where P and Q are polynomials, span. What's going on over here? This here is going to have some very specific form. This is going to have a very specific form. This is going to have minus P of T plus T. Really, so I don't know if you can span now. Well, that's kind of interesting. Is that left hand set meant to. Is that like for any polynomial? Yes. P and Q? Yep, for any polynomial this P and Q, and for any polynomial this P, it might be different from this P. Maybe I'll call these guys R, I guess, just so that they're different. Just so it's clear that they're different. P, Q, and R. So this is for, for all P and Q and R polynomials. Hmm. Well, that certainly seems kind of funky, doesn't it? Well, I guess without loss of generality, though. You know, I could. What does this set look like? Well, remember, this is a quotient. Vector space quotient, well now it's a module quotient. Okay, fine, whatever. The definition is basically the same. I'm going to add all of these guys to all the various multiples of these guys to 
kind of form the cosets like we did before. Same kind of argument. Yeah. Is that the oh, question? Yeah. I answer. Yeah. Okay. Right. So the point is, I want to form the cosets. On the cosets. What do the cosets look like? Well, gosh, the cosets look basically like p of t, q of t, <coughs> plus any and all possible guys like this. Looks like I just did some fancy footwork with the parentheses, and basically that's what I did, but this now. This is a set of pairs of polynomials. This is a set of pairs of polynomials. Yes, is the coset representative, precisely. Yes, this is the coset representative. Exactly. And that idea there really is something that's kind of useful to think about. Notice that all of these cosets have an element in them that I can use as a representative, sort of a canonical representative, in which the first slot is zero. Just by choosing R equals P, then the first guy cancels out. So this is really coset representative zero Q. I guess it's Q of T minus T times uh, P of T, plus then this chunk over here, then this would be minus P of T, and this is T P of T. There we go. And all my friends. So there's a distinguished way to write this down. It kind of uniquely nails down each of these various cosets. So they're really only parameterized by something like this. Now this, since Q was arbitrary to begin with, this is really important point highlighted in red. This is actually an arbitrary polynomial. So what we've done is we've collapsed this down from being generated by two elements to generating by one by doing this quotient. Now, all of that seems to be a long drawn out way of saying that in this case, the same argument that worked in vector space land work over here. That's math, isn't it? That's luck in this case. <laughs> yeah. Um, so because we ended up getting a polynomial um, on that bottom entry that's one degree up from... Wait, uh, wait, 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 wait. This one? Yeah. So this, this is not one degree up. It's two degrees. This is still the same degree as I started with because of the Q. Uh, yeah, 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 you're right. But I could put P, I could put a P. P happens to be zero, then, or I could have, I can cancel off that T, rather. It's not necessarily one degree up. Why would you, can't, how would if you I put Q equals T, P of T, time, plus a whole bunch of other junk, it'll cancel off this. Oh, okay, so as long as, uh, as long as Q is sufficiently high degree, but degree one or higher, yeah. yeah. I, can, I can set this up to knock this thing down to be degree zero if I want. So I can make this any any polynomial I like by choosing Q appropriate. Mm, okay. Great. So this is really an arbitrary so polynomial. Zero have degree zero or no degree. What's that? No degree. No degree. It is zero has no degree. Zero is no degree. Yeah. Correct. It, it it's not, not degree zero. It's no degree. That's yeah. correct. So yeah, because if it had degree zero, there would be issues. There would be big problems. It's yes, infinitely many zeros. Yes, it. big problems indeed. All right. So yes. we converted the R of T and the T R of T into the P of T. That's right. In order, in order to make this happen, in order to make this transition, I chose a particular representative for my cosine here. So in order to do this, I chose R of T equals P of T. Yes. 
So the observation is now that it's an arbitrary polynomial, this thing really it has just one generator. This, this is a, a module with one generator. That module with one generator, that's the one connected component that persists. It started out here associated to the A, and later on it's associated to this other chunk over here. Component. In this particular example, yes. When, when I said luck, it was more I constructed it that way. I kind of knew what was going to happen. Similarly, you could do the things with the kernel. It's kind of cool with this one. How, how would I, what row operation would I do to figure out the kernel in this guy? No. What row reduction would I do? multiply them both by there. Okay, now we've got some choices, and the choices kind of matter, don't they? I could multiply the top one by t, and I'd be left with a t alone, or I could multiply the bottom one by 1 over t. Wait, can I do that? This is a field. No, 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 can I do that? I don't have any 1 over t's in my ring. Oh, this is where this sort of thing matters. I can't do that. I, even though it feels like I've got choices at this point, I no longer do. You must be careful about such things. Now, this is what, where I said, if you're doing this by hand, you'll figure that out pretty quick. But if you're doing it by computer, you need to be a little more careful. Okay. Now let's soup this up. As if this wasn't bad enough. Right, the only units of this are 1 and minus 1. That's right. And the only, exactly, I the only know. units <laughs> of in this ring are 1 and minus 1. That's right. I can't, I don't have, I have t to the 0, t to the 1, t to the 2, etc. That's all I got. So that, that had to prove that last week uh, to do a proof on the algebra homework. So it's, it's good stuff. But, uh, fundamentally, I mean, this is, this is the sort of algebra that, that you've known for a long time. And doing it by hand is not really a problem. The trick is to realize that I've just disallowed t to the minus 1, etc. What would that be if I allowed the t to the minus 1, etc.? What's that mean? So if, if every element is a unit of a field. Yeah, that's right. That's the, that's the field of fractions for an array. <coughs> Algebraically, what does it mean from a simplicial complex standpoint? It means that uh, some some stuff was. It means that there are some simplices that are bigger than your uh, bigger than x. Well, no, they're smaller than x zero. Uh, on this side, negative. right, right. So essentially, what it means is I've just moved the, this reference point, this zero, somewhere else in my complex or in my filtration. So I've just chosen a different spot to call birth time zero. Hmm. So it's, it's literally just shifting your focus. <laughs> so that algebraic thing has a, a reflection in the, in the combinatorial structure of the space you're studying. And that often shows up in algebraic topology, as you might suspect. The algebra tells you something about the topology. OK. So this is a very simple example in that there's one connecting component, and that connecting component kind of stays around for a while. Uh, what about now, if I were to add another point here, but not put the edge? So both the points are present, but the edge is not. B t to the 0. What's going on then? Well, let's try to find out. Well, let's take a look at what happens there. And importantly, there should be some action here that is going to show up, that is going to matter. And it's also going to have to show up with the image. All right. Here we go. So x0 here is just going to consist of a and b. a and b are present the whole time.
course, that's really the only change that I've made. Or is it? They've all showed up at time one. What about this AB thing? What did that show up? Well, it showed up at some time later. What time did it show up? It showed up at time one. <coughs> so maybe I should try to notate that somehow. Well, let's look at what the various possibilities are going on here. Well, for one thing, and this is something that didn't crop up in the previous example, and I didn't have to say this per se, but I'm not really looking at AB showing up at that particular time, am I? I'm looking at a very particular AB showing up at a very particular time. When does AB show up? It shows up at time one. So I should somehow tag that AB in a certain fashion. <coughs> When does the image of this show up? The image of this shows up at time one. Hmm. Okay. The kernel is basically telling you that there are these two potential connected components. When does this show up? Well, it really should not be a B now, should it? It should be T times A. That's, that's kind of the, the, the important thing here. So the issue. Our computation like this, as we've done this, it's just a plain old chain complex. Oops, this would have been t to the zero to the zero. Uh, this would have been a plain old chain complex, and we would never see the fact that at time zero there are two connected components, and at time one there's only one. We never see that. So if we use one-dimensional symbolises, these are zero-dimensional symbolises. Right. The, these two diagrams are not really related. Oh, okay. yeah. hmm. Well, if you look at it here, what would you really want to have happen? You would really want, really want, something happen, we really want to have H0 reflect the fact that a component dies. If you look at the barcode diagram, but remember this is what we're trying to encode. The barcode diagram should look like this for H0. It should be I should have two connected components. One of them should pers persist, and one of them should die. This is what we want to have happen.
this is what we want to have happen. How do we make it? What, what would this look like algebraically? You mean uh, talking about the maps you're putting here, your spaces? Well, this is in terms of the maps between the spaces. Well, now remember, H0 is supposed to be this polynomial component thing. What do we want the polynomials to look like that span H0? What do I want them to look like? How should that appear in terms of polynomials? Remember, we're trying to represent this in terms of polynomials. Well, how should what? How should this barcode repre representation appear algebraically? We're going to write down what H0 looks like. H0 is going to be a vector, kind of a vector in the computer science sense. It's going to have two slots. One slot for this component, one slot for that component. And each of them is going to have a polynomial in there, keeping track of the coefficient, keeping track of the birth and death times. It's supposed to be like the maps of uh, two of the rows to uh, be the same. Same kind of degree, right? Yeah. Yeah, we want them to be the same kind of degree in some fashion. So how might we do that? Well, gosh, let's look at it this one. This one here, without algebra, let's call that a one in that slot. What about this one? That how should that be? Could be a T, maybe? Yeah. Could be a T. Here, one minus T, yeah, 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 something of that sort. Yes, this, this should somehow reflect the fact that it's present in one and not in the other. Or rather, maybe this one should be, maybe not one, but should be one plus T, and this is just one. Maybe. So maybe, maybe. Maybe you could do it that way. Hmm. So which of these seem reasonable? Well, if this is just a 1, and this is a 1 plus or minus t or something like that, now what we're looking at is this polynomial here has only support with terms in that slot, or in that degree. This has got terms in both of them. Hmm. Okay. Something of this sort ought to be what's going on. How do I get that to come out of the algebra? Well, let's look at it. Let's format it in the same way. Let's format it in the same way. want h0 of x to be something like span r of t of just one generator, now possibly two, right? We want it to be something like this, plus or minus t, plus then some kind of, some kind of set. That's really what we want, something like that. That's what we want. Something of the sort like that. Now, depending on exactly how we play out with our bases, we'll get one or the other. Okay. So how is this going to work? Uh, well, do we want then our numerator? Sorry. The, you don't really call it the numerator of the quotient. The yeah, quotient. you call it the numerator. Yeah, sure, whatever. The numerator of the quotient. Well, we know what that is. That's everything. Right? Because remember, this is this is the kernel of boundary zero. That's everything. Module of the image. Delta one. So we know this is everything. This thing here, we know exactly what that is. This is the span 
over R of T. One comma one zero. So we need to decide what we want to module. That's right. And that will tell us what the right map should be here. Because I claim the map that we just wrote down isn't quite the right one for this task. Can I take a guess? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe flip the uh, flip the entries. Vector above and negate one of them. Something of the sort, yeah. Let's let's write this out in terms of polynomials like we had on this board a little while ago, and that, that will make this a little more clear. What have, how do you have two bar, two lines for one barcode? How do I have two? Yeah. Because you have two. So I have two connected components initially, the A and the B. The A point and the B points are there. Yeah. So this is say A and B, and then at the next time step, at time one, one or the other of them merges into the other. And I've only got one component left. This is at time zero, and this is at time one. So one or the other of them goes away. You know, you can think of A going away, or you can think of B going away, or some linear combination or something of the sort. The trick is, remember, let's not lose sight of the goal. The goal here is to figure out how to modify our definition of boundary one, so that this sort of thing comes out the other. This is the cleverness of this paper. It's the realization that you could rewrite that down matrix. OK, so let's write these out as polynomials. This is a set of polynomials, arbitrary in the first and second slot. This thing here has got to be something that when I quotient it will end up being something like this. Leave it as that. In the moment, let's now expand this. This is going to be p of t plus p of t plus or minus or something like that t times t. Multiply polynomials plus some set plus other stuff. So now, really, what I want to do is I want to know about what do I need to add. I need to add to force this kind of construction. To pull out these as the vectors that I see. Coset representative thing. It's remember this is going to be plus a set, a set of vectors which are going to be the image of D1. In fact, this is D1 right there. Whatever that is, that's that's the, this is going to be the answer. So really what we want is we want something like this going to happen. kind of form uh, when you're when you're trying to uh, take a look at I've got a when, I'm, when you're trying to divide things this is this is kind of how you divide it you have something like n times this thing here plus that these are forming out my equivalent fractions for instance 
one, one plus or minus t. What's that? Oh, plus that. How do I how do I do this? T plus the top R T. So you put two equations. Mm -hmm. I'll give you some extra coefficients if you need them. If you need a coefficient here, I'll add that in. That makes that easier. So, you're not given any restrictions on what R is, correct? No. So, that means the top can be anything. Yeah, the top could be anything. The yeah. second one, the bottom just needs to be uh, degree one or greater. Is that correct? Uh, well, no, but it needs to be basically that same thing plus T times itself. Right, so how do I do this? Fair enough. Fair enough. How do I do this? Okay, this, this? This ought to be just good old algebra, right? It's like R has to be P, and then I've got to basically choose my R in the right way. I need uh, what if we made R equal to P? Well, if R is equal to P, I might have to cancel out with the Q in a certain way, right? So then we, then all we would need to do is set uh, well, the bottom. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's not gonna work, is it? Let, let's try. It. Let, let's say R. Let, let me let me now expand these out in terms of coefficients for you. So this is sum p i k i q t is sum q i p i and R is sum. All the I's. All, all of those I's are in our ring. Yes. Or in our field, actually. Okay, so now let's write all this thing, all of this stuff out. This is sum pi ti. This is sum qi ti. Plus this thing we need to find. And now we've got the sum ri pi. But now something is happening down here. What is happening down here? I T on plus or minus or something. Um, R I I plus one. T I plus one. So I can do some index mangling and put the put these all in the same spot. Some, do some index mangling here. So now this is R0 plus sum from I equals, uh, let's say from 1 and onward. What did I do? I kicked out this first term and then I'm going to restabilize these guys. So these guys are all in terms of TIs. So this is then an R I plus or minus 1. I'll let you guys figure that out in a moment. Ah, I'm going to leave this one alone. What do I do to this one? What does this index now become down here? Minus one. Yes. Minus one. Yes. Okay. So that's the name of the game. Now I don't actually care what R is. Remember, this is the thing I'm trying to solve for. I just want to put my matrix, uh, put this expression in this form for some r by adding on something like that. Should we have r sub i plus or minus r sub i minus? Ah, yeah. It's good. No, I mean like um, r sub i. Here. Yes. Would it be r sub i minus 1 plus or minus r sub i based on the way our summation is written? r plus sub i minus 1 plus or minus. No, this, this, one, this one is here because I'm just continuing on in my sum. Oh, right, yeah, no, never mind, never mind, yeah, right. Yeah. And then this sorry. is the plus or minus right here, and then this is the rest of it. So it's indexing, sorry. Yep, index on. Mm -hmm. Yep, beware of the index. What's the thing on the top of your sum? Infinity or something. <laughs> And, you know, as, as, as far as you care to go, these are polynomials. It's K. It's K goes with him. Yeah, basically. Yes, in fact. It's absolutely right. Okay. Now, unfortunately, 
fortunately or unfortunately, and I have to leave you hanging based on time. So. It's a nail biter. It's a nail biter, exactly. So we will come back next time, finish up this calculation, and figure out what we need to do that. But basically, the point is there's a very simple thing we can put in there. It's going to make all of this go away. It's going to all come out. 42. It's yeah. not 42. <laughs> Not 42. It's something, a very simple expression that involves T. 42. T. T times 42 is not. <laughs> okay. All right. So, until next time, you hit the.